The Canon C100 Mark II has been my main camera for nearly four years. In that time, I've really got to know it, how to use it, and how to get the best out of it. In fact, you could say it's not just a camera. It's become a friend accompanying me through <laughs> Okay, that's taken it a bit too far, but the point is I've figured out how to get good images out of it. So, here are 10 tips on how to get cinematic footage with a Canon C100 Mark II. The higher the ISO, the more noise in your image, right? This is true, but only past the camera's native ISO. In this case, the C100 has a native ISO of 850, so going below that won't give you a cleaner image. In fact, you shouldn't go below it. When you go below a camera's native ISO, you can start to have a lot of problems with the highlights. In fact, when you start lowering the ISO below 850 on the C100, you start to hear a whooshing noise. This noise is all of your highlight dynamic range leaving the camera in search of something else to do. In plain English, your highlights are going to get really messed up. And I mean really messed up. The highlights might look like they're at the correct point on the waveform, but there will be no detail in them whatsoever. They've clipped at a point way below where they normally would, and good luck trying to make this footage look natural in post. Even though the C100 has internal ND filters, on a really bright day, even the strongest ND isn't always enough. But I don't care what you have to do. Raise the shutter speed, stop down the lens, get a matte box for extra ND filters. Do not lower the ISO below 850. The C100 Mark II performs very well in low light. Not quite as well as a Sony A7S Mark II, but still really well. This is in no small part down to having a relatively low megapixel sensor at just around 8 megapixels. This allows for larger photo sites, which are more sensitive to light, but that's not a practical tip. For the practical tip, basically up to ISO 6400 is pretty usable. Certainly, I think nothing of hitting ISO 2000. This is a shed. But more importantly, it's a dark and gloomy shed, which presents an excellent opportunity to demonstrate the noise levels of the C100 at different ISOs. From past experiences, I find it's much better to focus on exposing your image properly rather than worrying about keeping the ISO as low as possible. When it comes to post-production and color correction, it's much easier to remove noise from footage than it is to raise the levels of underexposed footage to try and recover detail from the shadows. This is especially true if you're using the camera's internal recording. Talking of exposing your image properly, this brings me on to my next tip, correct exposure. Where possible, you want to overexpose your footage a bit, then bring back down the levels in post. The reason for this is because of how the image is being recorded. Theoretically, if you could capture your image with every single part of it being at the perfect exposure, there wouldn't be much benefit in doing this. However, most of the time, footage needs the exposure adjusted a bit in color correction before it looks good. Think of it as a sort of a safety net. And as I said before with the high ISO tip, it's much easier to lower the exposure of an image than to try and pull detail from the shadows. Underexposed images tend to become very grainy and show a lot of compression when the brightness is increased. This overexposing your image is known as exposing to the right, as the histogram trace is towards the right. But how do you get the right exposure when you're filming? When you're shooting outside, most of the time I find the safest and quickest way to expose is to expose as bright as possible without blowing out the sky. This tends to make best use of the C100's 12 stops of dynamic range. If this results in your subject being underexposed, then you can raise the exposure using lights or reflectors. Blowing out the sky is a very easy way to make your footage look video-ish and unprofessional. For this reason, I like to use my zebras and set them at 100%. That way, you see a zebra, you have a problem. Yeah, I don't really know what noise a zebra makes. Now I do understand that there may be some times when you have to blow up the sky a little bit to get exposure on your subject. But if you have to do that, then use a shallow depth of field to blur the sky a bit, which makes overexposed areas much less obvious. It's also a good idea to use a black promist filter, and I'll talk more about that later in the video. It's a similar principle indoors, but as you're usually dealing with darker scenes, be careful not to overexpose too much. The C100 is an 8-bit camera, meaning if you start trying to push levels around too much, 
you'll start distorting your image. For a rough guide, look at your waveform and keep the skin tones at or below 70%. The C100 Mark II has several different shooting profiles, but only two of them are worth using. And when I say that, I really mean use C-Log unless you absolutely cannot grade your footage, which you should, then you can use the wide DR profile. But even if all you're going to do is slightly drop the shadows and bump the saturation and color correction, I'd still use C-Log just for the extra control. Even when I'm filming conferences and the color correction for a two hour video only takes five minutes, even then, I still use C-Log. For any project that's remotely creative, it's a non-starter. Put the C100 Mark II in C-Log and leave it that way. Right, now I've made that point, why shoot C-Log? It's a really good way to maximize dynamic range in your footage. Honestly, you will struggle to get the full 12 stops out of the C100, and dynamic range is so important for getting aesthetically pleasing cinematic footage. You get more control in post-production for color correction and color grading too. The idea is to capture a very clean, neutral image when you're shooting, then you can give the footage its look in post-production. With any other of the camera profiles, the look is pretty much baked into the footage. Sure, you can adjust it, but it's going to be an uphill battle. And don't worry if you don't know how to color correct footage. It's not as hard as you might think. And this brings me on to... Let's go! Whilst C-Log is flatter than any of the other camera profiles, it's actually one of the least flat log profiles. This means it's one of the easiest log curves to grade. I don't want to turn this video into a color grading tutorial, so I'm not going to go through my C-Log grading process step by step, but here are a few tips I've picked up. It's much easier to increase the brightness for the overall image, then fine tune the shadows and highlights, than it is to increase the brightness of just the midtones. That can often start to push the 8-bit color space too far, if you boost just the midtones too much. While this is true of pretty much every camera, make sure you properly balance out all the colors basically advanced white balancing in the image. You can use auto white balance, the curves for highlight and offset wheels, just make sure you have a nice neutral image. I do see a lot of people asking how to give your footage a certain look, but honestly if all you do is properly balance out your footage, it will already look so much better than just slapping a LUT on some unbalanced footage. Remember all your C100 Mark II footage is only 8-bit, so be very careful about overgrading it. Whilst you can create some very striking looks, when you're learning, I'd say less is more. <laughs> When you're recording footage internally, you're limited to a 420, 24, 28 megabit per second, MP4 and AVC HD. This footage is downsampled from the 4K sensor to create 1080p footage. Honestly, I continue to be amazed how high quality such a small file size can be. The C100 is an incredibly efficient camera, but sometimes you just want a little bit more and that's where an external recorder can come into play. But are they worth using and what are the benefits? Well, you can get 422 ProRes HQ from the HDMI port, although it's still only 8-bit. Yes, ProRes is a 10-bit container, so technically the files will be 10-bit, but there's no actual benefit there as you'll only have enough data for 8-bit color. I have had a few people request an in-depth video about the C100 and external recorders, which I am working on, but for now, here's a quick summary. If you're doing VFX work, then it's 100% worth using an external recorder. When you're zooming into your footage to mark things out and doing green screen work, the less compressed footage is going to make your life so much easier. And more importantly, you're going to get better looking edges around your VFX elements. If you're going to be doing heavy color grading, such as anything involving film convert or doing day for night effects, then again, definitely worth using an external recorder. But if you just want a bit of a boost in image quality, then it's of debatable value. Will you see any difference without a heavy color grade? Not much of one. But if you want the peace of mind of knowing you're capturing the highest quality footage possible, then an external recorder might still be worth considering. Any other situation, and I'd say don't bother. Certainly for corporate work and live performances, it's not worth the extra file space. For more details, check out the dedicated external recorder video, which I will be uploading soon. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss that.
When you remove the top handle and side handle from the C100 Mark II, it's actually compact enough to fit on most medium sized gimbals. I use a Freefly Movi M5 with my C100 and I've had a lot of success with it. In fact, some of my best footage has been captured with that combination. When using the C100 on a gimbal, autofocus becomes very important if you want any kind of shallow depth of field. Sadly, with most lenses, the C100 can only focus on whatever is in the center of the image, although face tracking is available with EFS lenses. But I don't use EFS lenses very often. Because of this, it's very useful to be able to lock and unlock the autofocus. But how do you do this when the camera is mounted on a gimbal? First, remap focus locking to button 7 on the hand grip, which is normally the magnify button. Then you want to mount the hand grip on the side of the gimbal. I'm using the Zakuto grip relocator. Yes, I know it's very expensive, but there aren't many alternatives. And I'm using a short rail kit from Smallrig to mount the grip relocator to the Movi. And I'm using the included accessory mount that comes with the Movi. You can experiment with putting the grip in different places, but I've found that this location is the most convenient so far. I can either hold the grip and have access to several camera controls, or I can do what I usually do and hold the Movi handle and then reach my thumb round to lock and unlock the focus. It does take a bit of practice, but when you get the timing down, you can get a surprising amount of control over the autofocus, which allows for some very cinematic gimbal shots. Talking of autofocus, Here's an autofocus tip. If you want to get the best possible autofocus performance, then use Canon STM lenses. They are silent and they focus incredibly smoothly. They're not too expensive either. Then very close behind the STM lenses are the Canon L lenses. They are nearly silent and focus incredibly quickly and smoothly, just like the STM lenses. Although as they have a much better image quality and they're much faster, I generally use L lenses most of the time. Don't get me wrong, I love the Sigma lenses. In fact, I have two of them, the 24-105 f4 as well as the legendary wide angle 18-35 f1.8 art. They produce a lovely image, but for autofocus, they just can't keep up with the Canon lenses. They're noisier, slower, and the focus pulls don't quite look as smooth. And it's the same story for all third party lenses. To be honest, these Sigma lenses are a best case scenario. I have seen much worse. Yes, third party lenses are cheaper and they offer some unique focal lengths. But if you want maximum autofocus performance, then stick with Canon L lenses or the Canon STM lenses. <laughs> Everyone loves slow motion. One of the biggest improvements of the C100 Mark II over the Mark I was the inclusion of proper 60fps slow-mo. In fact, the C100 Mark II gives you two ways of recording slow-mo, but which one should you use? The first method, slow and fast recording, slows down your footage in camera. This is great for playing back your footage in camera and means less work when editing, but there's one major disadvantage, no sound recording. The other method of recording slow motion is to set the frame rate to 60fps and then record normally. Yes, you will have to slow the footage down in post, but sound will be recorded. Given how important sound design is for your video's production value, I prefer the option of recording in 60fps and then slowing down the footage in post production. And for my last tip, we have a tip that applies to almost any camera, not just the C100. But I really wanted a tenth tip, and this is one of the coolest tips, so here goes anyway. The Tiffin Black Pro Mist is a diffusion filter. It's available both as a matte box filter and as a circular screwing filter like the one I have. It is on the pricey side, but the results are just incredible, and in my opinion, they are worth every single penny. It removes some of the sharpness out of your image, but without touching the amount of detail. And it also gives you a nice halo around any bright light source. I know that might sound a bit underwhelming at first, especially considering the price, but it has the power to take a significant chunk of video-ishness out of your image and get you closer to that elusive 
film look. And you don't need to do anything else to get the benefits. I've used this filter on every single big project I've done in the past few years, and it's become one of my favourite underrated pieces of equipment. I think it gives your footage a slightly vintage vibe, not too much. You still get a very clean look, but it just takes the edge out of your footage. Do you remember earlier when I was talking about blowing out highlights, and in particular the sky? Well, with this filter, because of halation, it gives any bright areas of your image a smooth roll off, which can help hide any blown out parts of the image. It's the same sort of effect you get when you use haze or fog to soften your image. Honestly, I can't recommend this filter enough. I'm using the one quarter strength for a subtle effect, but there's also an eight filter if you want to have an even more subtle effect. But if you want a stronger filter, then there is a one half, a one and a two strength to choose from. So there are my 10 tips for getting cinematic footage out of the Canon C100 Mark II. Yes, there are other things to keep in mind like composition and lighting, but I wanted this list to be as C100 specific as possible. I hope you found these tips useful and I hope that they help you to get cinematic footage out of your C100 Mark II as well. If they did, let me know in the comments down below and let me know what you found when you applied the tips to your work. If you did enjoy the video, then please consider leaving a like and subscribing so as not to miss any new videos. See you later.